Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of our brand new slow and immersive playthrough of Stellaris. The Cosmic Storms DLC has just come out yesterday along with patch version 3.13. And I think the game is in a great state, uh, only getting better and better with every patch. Unfortunately, I had to abandon my previous Broken Shackles playthrough earlier in the year, but it seems like that was met with really good reception. Uh, and people enjoyed it, but unfortunately due to work reasons I had to... Well, I basically stopped posting videos and then the game just kind of ran away from me with the Machine Age expansion uh, and so on. I promise I will see this playthrough till the end, uh, as I think I will have time and there shouldn't be any new expansions coming out before the end of the year for sure. Probably even before, you know, uh, April next year. So, yeah, the game is in a great state. We'll be playing on the hardest difficulty, same as our, my previous playthrough. We'll be playing very slowly, you're reading through every anomaly text, you know, every little kind of immersive description of every tech and every ship, because that's how I like to play. I play like that in single player as well, believe it or not, and I like to leave time between playthroughs um, so that I kind of forget as to what the game is. I also try not to read any guides and, um, and kind of, I try not to play the meta and try not to even know what the meta really is. And instead make my own assessment as to, you know, what is the best thing to do with which empire. And create empires based on kind of an interesting narrative story rather than picking, you know, the meta, civics, etc, uh, etc. Et so if this is your, you know, your cup of tea, your jam, then uh, stay on and give it a like. Uh, especially for in the first few episodes to get the series out there. But for now, yeah, I guess for those who have seen the Broken Shackles playthrough, hopefully this will get even better. Let's go ahead and jump into a new game. And I'll explain, I will go over the Empire we'll be playing and then we'll go over the difficulty settings. So I've pre-created this Empire here and the Hesukaran Empire. I've also pre-played it for the first kind of 10 years just to get the hang of the game. And again, I haven't really played Stellaris since Astral Planes. I think that Broken Shackles playthrough was the only time I played. So that was sort of January, February this year. Otherwise, I actually do have 700 hours in Stellaris and I've been playing it, you know, on and off since it's come out in what, 2016. 9th of May 2016 was the date. Um, and yet, you know, I've never played a Gestalt Empire. I've never played a Machine Empire. Uh, so, you know, and the game has changed so much with the patches. And this is why I love it is that We'll be playing, of course, with all DLC enabled, everything they could possibly include. And the game is just, I think, so deep and so immersive. Uh, I really do think it's probably the greatest game of all time for me. That is undoubtedly so. Uh, and I'm surprised that I, it, I haven't really featured it more on my channel. I think I've definitely featured you know, Hearts of Iron and Victoria 3 more. But Victor Stellaris is really my favorite. So let's go over, you know, the Empire we'll be going with. So we're going with Hesukaran Empire, hailing from the world of Kelzaka, a tundra world. And they're a sort of kind of goat kind of uh, people. Uh, are we, the, the origin we're going with, uh, hence kind of the tundra world, I guess. We're going with the cybernetic creed origin. Uh, this empire pursues a divine calling the fusion of exalted body and holy cybernetics. Augmentation is worship. And this is basically a spiritualist and kind of techie empire. I think that's a really interesting role play kind of immersive combination. Uh, and they do have, you know, quite a few things that are different about them. Uh, and, and I think the kind of the immersiveness or the role play extends through into kind of mid game, which I really like. And I think that fits with our playstyle that will fit with our playstyle very well. So the cybernetic creed will go over this in more detail when we get into the game. But for now, let's just uh, get the basics. So this basically blocks us into the cybernetic ascension paths, which means kind of we remain organic species, but we modify ourselves quite heavily with um, uh, cyber implants to enhance ourselves in various ways. Now, with this origin, the home world will have initial buildings replaced by Creed infrastructure, and there will be, uh, well, as, sorry, the next point is cybernetic Creed factions formed shortly after game start. And there's basically four of them, hence our little emblem here with the 
Uh, again, we'll see what the civics are, but we have our god emperor in the middle and the four pillars, the four churches of the original, you know, cybernetic creed, you know, supporting him. That's that's how I came up with the logo. Um, and again, guys, believe it or not, this is the way I play in, in single player as well. I kind of sometimes think that probably is a bit crazy, but I, that's the way I play. I like everything to be, you know, thematically kind of and narratively cohesive. Uh, so there is, there is our homeworld. We'll have creed infrastructure. We have cre cybernetic creed factions. We have a spiritualist trait, ritualistic implants that will, uh, it's basically a trait that is applied to all pops that are effectively born or, you know, or are existing from the start of the game with a spiritualist um, faction. I'm actually curious, and I don't know if pops switch into the spiritualist faction. Do they get ritualistic implants? I think they do, actually. Um, yeah, and, it, 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 and we'll see what that does. It's, we also have guaranteed research option for integrated cybernetics, which allows us to go into the cybernetic ascension path. Uh, and again, it's sort of customized here. And ascension is, of course, one of the most important uh, decisions you will make uh, for your species in Stellaris. And here we can grab it early, uh, although we don't necessarily, I think, gun for the Ascension uh, because you do need other things to for the Cybernetic Ascension. You need some text to actually make it, you actually make use of it. Uh, but we can do it and we don't need to th spend an Ascension perk, which is uh, actually very nice uh, to Ascend. Now the Cybernetic Creed Priesthood Jobs, that is the last feature, which is effectively our priests, become horror specs um, jobs uh, that, you know, again, we'll, we'll get into more detail once we see our planet, what those jobs actually do. So that's us. We're a cybernetic creed origin, Hesukar, mammalian, sort of goats living in tundra on the world of Kelzaka. Um, our species traits are natural engineers. Members of this species have a natural inclination towards engineering and material sciences. Hence, obviously, you know, through the ages, the first thousands of years that they've evolved on Kelzaka, they have um, been tinkering, you know, they're natural engineers, uh, and they sort of have this affinity for uh, cybernetic implants, right, and some sort of enhancements to their body and mind. They're also traditional, however. Certain aspects of this species' cognition makes it predisposed to especially value historical precedence and group unity. That will give us unity, uh, stems and unity from jobs as natural engineers will give us 15% engineering research. Uh, and this is together with conformists. These people always seek consensus and are more likely to conform to the governing ethics. Governing ethics attraction plus 30%. This is sort of my way of, um, again, weaving in these traits to the fanatic spiritualist and we'll see what the civics are as well. But effectively, you know, they're sort of herd type animals kind of evolving from some sort of ancient goats uh right hence yeah they're traditional and conformist they kind of go in large groups they're spiritualist uh but, yeah, but they, do, they do like to tinker and because they do like to tinker uh, around with you know kind of all sorts of engineering projects they are slow breeders this species reproduces at a slow rate lowering population growth uh pop growth speed minus 10 percent uh quite punishing i think especially on the difficulty we'll be playing with uh you know the population growth, I, I think, it, for me, is one of the most important, um, I guess, buffs or debuffs uh, you can have. I will try to do everything I possibly can to improve population growth. But there we are. We're sort of these big goats that, you know, probably maybe a bit coy, maybe a bit kind of in their head, a bit spiritualist as well. They spend a lot, a lot of time worshipping, uh, you know, the gods or we'll see the god emperor. And it's not, not a lot of time for breeding is left. Uh, so that's kind of the species. And uh, that's how that links up with uh, Cybernetic Creed. In terms of our civics, well, actually, let's go with our ethics, right? So we're a fanatic spiritualist, of course. Our science has proved that consciousness begets reality. We regard with patience the childlike efforts of those who delude themselves. It is the other way around as they play with their blocks of hard matter. And this means we can build temple buildings um, and we also get monthly unity plus 20%, edict upkeep minus 20% and edict cost is minus 20%. Again, this sort of ties into with the sort of traditionalist, conformist and cybernetic creed. You know, we are spiritualists at our core. 
who are traditional conformists, we do like to tinker with uh, all sorts of implants, hence that, that sort of religion uh, over time as this species evolved has kind of, you know, that religion and that affinity to sort of technology has fused into something like a cybernetic creed. We're also authoritarian, uh, and I thought, you know, of all the of all the ethics, I thought this is kind of um, what, what goes best with our narrative. There's sort of one alpha male, or maybe alpha female, sort of uh, leader of the herd. Uh, you know, we do have a tendency to kind of conform and value that sort of precedency and group unity. So we do have one strong leader in general. But we're not fanatical about it, but we are authoritarian. So a strong guiding hand is essential to the success of any civilization. The alternative would be anarchy and chaos. It is the duty of the state to steer its citizens towards the paths that are the most productive. And we get monthly influence plus 0.5 and worker pop resource output plus 5%. Stratified economy uh, for living standards and we can enslave other aliens, cannot use democratic governments and we don't need to. Now together, this gives us the divine empire type of government. This government is a form of spiritualistic autocracy. Everything is shaped by the official state religion and the ruler is worshipped as an infallible living god. Uh, we are also imperial. Uh, again, that may imperial governments are similar to dictatorial ones, except that the throne is always inherited by a designated successor upon the ruler's death. So we will have our god emperor and we will have, uh, you know, an heir. Um, who will succeed uh, the emperor upon upon the ruler's death. Uh, what the imperial government really gives us, though, is the capital system effects, resources from jobs uh, plus 10%. So we will have a you know, highly centralized empire. You know, our capital will be, you know, the seat of our um, ruler, the seat of our emperor, who is the high priest, so to speak, of our religion, the living deity, living god, which, which all the religious sort of apparatus will be on that world. And that is everything to our species. Empire effects, however, we get a leader pool size minus one. And our ruler, empire effects per skill level, will give us max influence from power projection plus 0 0.25 and an edict fund of plus five. Imperial, you know. So that's kind of uh, the, what the imperial government gives us. Now, finally, let's go with our civics. Now, not only do we have an emperor, uh, you know, strong imperial ruler who everyone worships as a living god. Uh, but we do, we do also have an imperial cult. This society has a dominant state religion where the ruler is worshipped as a living deity. Again, going together with the imperial sort of divine empire. Th the, uh, that gives us the effects of ruler's home planet has additional priest jobs. We also get an edict fund of 100 plus 100. So the word of the emperor is, of course, law and must be obeyed. Uh, and we have a council position of Prime Herald. Empire effects per skill level. It gives us priest output plus 2%. However, we also, you know, this, is, this isn't, you know, because we are kind of traditional conformists and we're natural engineers, we're intelligent and we have cybernetic creed. Uh, our ruler is a philosopher king, right? There is an imperial cult, but he's an intelligent, mindful ruler. It is not enough to simply rule. The ship of state must be guided by a king that wields enough wisdom and knowledge to steer it true. And that gives our ruler, effective ruler, skill modifier of plus five. We also get a council position of Lord Chancellor, which gives our council experience gain plus three percent per level. Um, and yeah, it's available to all, well, available to all um, types of leaders. So there we are. You know, that's our empire, Hesukaran Empire, living on Tundra world of Kelzaka. We've got cybernetic uh, ship appearance, but we are a cybernetic creed of natural engineers, traditional conformist type species, these sort of cybernetic, cyber enhanced goats that are slow breeders. We are fanatic spiritualist and authoritarian, uh, you know, and we have developed a system of this imperial cult. Um, but, you know, on the, on, on the upside, our, our rulers are philosopher kings. You know, we do have a system of breeding uh, and putting the right, I guess maybe it was the alpha male now, since it's hereditary, uh, the transfer of power, you know, the, the, the bloodline of the, the imperial bloodline and the education system is producing, you know, one philosopher king after the other. 
So that's our empire, guys. We, we will talk through it even even more once we get into the game. But let's go ahead and actually get into the game. So, as I mentioned, in terms of the difficulty settings, we'll be going with uh, you know pretty much the hardest settings you could possibly get into. This is not meant to be a playthrough where you know we dominate the galaxy. You know, we're going to just kind of eek and you know and scratch. I don't know and fight every every you know every day that we exist in this galaxy for our survival you know um it will be hard you know it, it is quite possible we will lose an early game there's i think that's small chance but it's possible there's a chance we'll lose in mid game you know there's chance and chance we'll uh, lose in late game uh, but this you know this this setup is not meant to for us to succeed it's meant for us to just you know give our best uh to you know just find our place in this galaxy so this will be a medium-sized galaxy 600 stars uh you know that's just kind of how i like it uh and you know it's, i think it's a good balance between number of empires and just kind of actually remembering what each empire is about uh, and just keeping that in your head for kind of immersion purposes it'll be a spiral four arms uh again i think that's kind of you know immersive and sort of realistic in a sense i think that's how most galaxies look like or at least that's my you know, uh, that's, that's that's my space knowledge. Uh, habitable worlds, we're going to go with 0 0.25, as low as possible, you know, because I want every planet to be significant, and I want us to be forced to settle planets where habitability is low, right? And if and fighting over planets with the empires uh, is important, and finding planets first is important, and claiming those systems, you know, and one planet changing hands in a war is significant, right? So habitable wars are extremely rare. And I think also that's very, well, I think it's immersive. I do think they probably are very rare, obviously, now that we know that. Now, guaranteed habitable, wor habitable wars is off. So yeah, we could end up, you know, we could get lucky, could get unlucky, could get have more, we have, could have less, could have no, no other habitable worlds. So we will have to think about, do we start playing tall? Do we start playing wide? Do we have the capability to play wide? We'll see. Empire placement is completely random. Uh, Pre-FTL civilization, so again, hyperland density, abandoned gateways, wormhole pairs, technology cost, everything's left as standard. You know, everything, I'm always satisfied with these settings. Uh, the growth ceiling is the same. Growth scaling, caravaneers is on, L gates on, Xeno compatibility is on if the AI wants it. I'm not sure we will get into that, but we'll leave it storm chance. Again, I have, I've only played, you know, like just a little bit yesterday when the DLC dropped. Uh, but as far as I understand, this is how often these storms will happen and they will sort of devastate planets. Uh, so yeah, can't wait to actually see that in the game. I think that'll be pretty cool, pretty interesting. But we'll leave this all on standard for now. I guess I'm just thinking now you could make an argument to you know increase this substantially given we're sort of claiming we're playing on really hard difficulties. <sighs> Should we? I mean, should we? I mean, I don't want to do anything crazy like 20 times, but should we do like double should we i'm gonna leave it on one i'm gonna leave it on one i don't really know how the dlc has actually been received to be honest seems like it's okay not sure how powerful these things are let's just leave it there for a bit of flavor uh, now in terms of number of empires we'll be going with 714 random again i think that's a good number so we'll be at about 10 empires you know on average let's say uh, and then we can remember what each empire is actually about, you know, what civics it has, what ethics it has, etc. Advanced AI starts, so all, yeah, so it could be all, could be about half of the empires will be advanced AI starts. The advanced neighbors uh, is on, so these advanced AI empires can spawn right next to us and just dominate us straight away. So, you know, I guess from, from the moment we get into the game, we need to think about, you know, we're in survival mode. We're fighting every day to survive. We'll have fallen empires between one and two. So there will be some, but we don't know how many. Marauder empires, maybe there will be one, maybe not. Crisis strength will be set to two. Random crisis type. Difficulty was, is, of course, Grand Admiral. Scaling difficulty is, of course, off. So they will have the, all the bonuses uh, the AI will have all the bonuses um, straight away, so they won't scale into you know, up to like mid-game. They will just be on Grand Admiral straight away. 
difficulty adjusted modifiers is off. I guess this is sort of, I mean, you. That's 40. Um, yeah, I mean, this I think is unnecessary. I mean, we're just making, because we're not doing like a meta playthrough. I do like to leave some room for immersion. I leave this off. You know, Grand Admiral already gives, uh, the AI gets massive bonuses to its economy, research, and naval capacity, you know. I think it is beatable, so it's not crazy, you know. Um, but it's, it's just, it's, just it's, it's a real challenge. And, you know, we can be vassalized and we can then fight a war of independence. But, you know, I, I don't like this one. Uh, I think that just kind of makes it a little too crazy. It makes it pretty much futile to resist. Or you have to have, you know, a completely meta build, which I also, I also don't like. Now, difficulty adjusted technology costs, just normal. AI aggressiveness is high, so if they do sense that we're weak, they will attack and they will band together against us. We'll have mid-game start uh, at around 23-25, so about 100 years into the game, and end game will start. I'm actually going to maybe actually push this out by 25 years because as far as I understand, tech has been changed quite a bit. I'm not sure when, if it was when I did the Broken Shackles playthrough or afterwards. But early in the year, the game with, I think, one of the patches has reworked tech and tech is now quite a bit slower. So let's give ourselves, you know, given the difficulty here, um, just a little bit more time. And given the habitable worlds is low, so there won't be that many pops around either. So let's give ourselves an extra 25 years. Uh, also allows, allows for a bit more immersion kind of role play. Now, victory is obviously off Iron Man, Iron Man mode on. Storm maximum early game. Two, okay, so it's two storms, five storms, eight storms. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get into it. I think that's already half of the episode. Let's see what we get. Okay, Hesukaran Empire. Our sublime calling is the unification of flesh and machine. Our history is replete with failed attempts, yet guided by the divine will, we have now achieved the first stage of a sacred symbiosis with our ritualistic implants. We have only begun to touch on our boundless cybernetic potential. More advanced augmentations are yet to come. Despite this, our faith stands divided, with competing creeds disputing the end goals of sacred augmentation. Once we answer this question, the perfect union of holy flesh and blessed technology will allow us to improve on the limited designs of evolution. To fuse is divine. Augmentation is worship. Indeed. Let's begin, guys. So, um, let's have a look at our Kelzaka. So it's Kel. So it's our, our system is called Kel and our capital planet of Kelzaka is right here. Let's go ahead and check it out quickly. It's a 19 size planet, Empire Capital, Tundra World. Uh, what we have, you know, the four buildings that it said, the Creed infrastructure. So we have the normal planetary administration. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll have a look at this in more detail when we actually unpause. But we have the amphitheater of the mind. Uh, this localized processing shrine allows the semi-connected choir of the mind to debate, share, and explore the secrets of the material plane at the speed of light. They give us researchers and haruspects, which is effectively priests and scientists. So that's choir of the mind. It's sort of the faction of our religion or church that focuses on science. We have forge of the fellowship. Here, the first forge of the Fellowship of the Hammer produces the highest quality construction materials. Hammers sing as the faithful pursue their divine work. So this gives us metallurgists and artisan jobs and haruspex jobs. So this is alloy producers, consumer goods producers. And haruspex are effectively priests that turn consumer goods into engineering research, unity and amenities. Which is further buffed by our natural engineers, right? Our... Uh, Fanatic spirituals give us plus 20% unity, and our traditional um, trait gives us plus 10% unity. So, you know, we're really going hard with the engineering research and unity here as a theme. Then we have battlements of steel. This fortress church houses both the armory and training grounds for the battle ready Templars of Steel. 
they stand ever vigilant to protect our divine flesh. Again, this is sort of gives us soldiers and Harrowspec's jobs. And then we have the Sanctuary of Toil. The Sanctuary of Coordinates repairs and rejuvenates the flesh and augmentations of the Commune of Toil. So I get these are sort of the church for the common people, just the resource kind of workers, the farmers, the technicians and the miners, the backbone, the backbone of our empire. And it also gives us some Harrowspec's, Harrowspec's jobs. We have an empty building slot. We obviously have no money to actually build anything. So for now, that's pretty much all there is to say about our home world. Again, we'll spend more time with it as we, when we once we actually unpause. A beautiful cybernetic station uh, here. Now, what else is there to review? I think to set up the game, let's go ahead and have a look at the research that we have. So we can do fusion reactor or administrative AI. Now I do want to do administrative AI to get the research speed up as early as possible. The fusion reactor is also quite nice, but that's 180 months. Wow. And this is 144 months. Let's go with administrative AI, organizational circuitry, rerouting, academic fervor. And plus, you're well about cybernetics. So let's go ahead and go with administrative AI for physics. Mm -hmm. In terms of our society research, what do we get? We have genome mapping, which is pop growth plus 10%. Don't need the food just yet. Don't need the defense, hopefully, just yet. But pop growth speed. Mapping the genome of an individual through the sequencing of their DNA opens up for tailored medical treatments and therapies. It leads, it leads to biological path further advancement in biological enhancement and adaptation should be 144 months as well and again i think that thematically fits with us looking for uh looking for uh i guess right to enhance our species in all sorts of ways ai genome mapping all of that now engineering i guess our favorite pastime let's see what we get here we do have integrated cybernetics that's 234 months habitability plus five percent don't need the habitability we could get go straight into that ascension this will always be available so i'm going to wait maybe a little bit 79 months and i think we'd rather do recoil guns Ooh. I think we'll probably rather do the armor so we can actually stay in the fight for a little bit longer if we need to. Yeah, let's do that. Because I do prefer lasers to coil guns anyway as a weapon uh, at the very start. So let's go ahead and get the ceramo metal armor. A combination of different metals and ceramics that results in a strong armor without sacrificing flexibility. Nice. So we got our research set up. Let's go ahead and just do a quick... We obviously have nothing in the situation log other than the cybernetic creed. In pursuing the divine calling, we shall achieve the fusion of the exalted body and sacred cybernetics. Nothing shall hinder our path to enlightenment. To fuse is divine. Augmentation is worship words to live by. Let's have, let's have a look at our government, though. So, our empire, we have our Omnisire, as I called him, as opposed to the normal designation of God Emperor. Omnisire Kale. Kale. And what is he? He's age 40. Nice, so quite young. He's spiritualist. Perfect. His home planet is obviously Kelzaka. He's an official. Um, he's not really a governor, though, so that doesn't really give us anything. He's level 1 of Official. Yeah, that doesn't really give us anything. Yeah. But he's principled. Uh, this leader is, has a strict code and follows our empires as morals, setting a good example for others. Of course, as a philosopher king would. Uh, this is a trait I picked when, when creating the empire. Now, he is also an imperial, and what that gives us is stability plus two, as long as uh, he's a counselor. And he always will be, because, you know, he has the position of the Omnissiah. He's an imperial ruler. Additional leader trade options plus one. And we get a Harrowspec jobs plus one. Block selection of non-council leader traits. 
Okay, so he always gets counsel at trades, yeah, because he's always on the council. Nice. Uh, we also get the realistic ritualistic implants, which you know give different bonuses to normal species. Uh, okay, it's the workers, and uh, they they also give some benefits to the leaders. So the leader trait is we get building and district upkeep. What you know, as long as this person, this leader, or Mr. Kale is a counselor, which he always will be. Building and district upkeep minus ten percent, and empire size from districts minus five percent. Excellent. These implants are proudly adorned by the faithful. Their dedication to the divine is an inspiration to all. And you can see he actually has a, a few implants in him already. He, you know, augmentation is worth it. What is that wording? To fuse as divine, augmentation is worship. Perfect. Who do we have then? I guess the second most important position uh, is a head of research. And we have Ida Patch here, age 38. She's, I guess it's a she, she's authoritarian though. Fine. She's head of research. Yeah, she's got no other traits. Interesting. But as head of research, the, the position itself, per skill level, it would get research speed plus 2%. Whereas Omniside gives us uh, max influence from power projection. So again, it will be important to build up our navy to get that influence so that we can actually expand. And we get Edict Fund plus 5. Head of research gives us research speed plus 2%. Okay. We'll take that. Per level, we get survey speed, archaeologic, archaeology skill, and astral rift skill. Okay, we do also have a minister of defense, 32 years of old, Shiv Hearth. Um, yeah, nothing special. I guess the minister of defense counselor position itself gives us ship upkeep minus two percent, army upkeep minus two percent, star base upkeep minus two percent. The minister of defense is in charge of military administration. And the head of research is in charge of all technology research. We do have a fourth position, which is sort of a custom position, but uh, again, available for pretty much everyone at the start, a minister of state, and that's filled by our official Ren Zane, age 30, the youngest, uh, the most junior, I guess, of our council members. And Ren Zane is an, oh, actually, okay, he has a nice summary here. Ren Zane is an authoritarian official from the tundra world of Kelzaka, where he previously held position of artisan Okay, also authoritarian. Interesting. Oh, they're all authoritarian, apart from our leader. Wow, that's very interesting. Okay, he used to be ship logistics officer, uh, spiritualist official, and she used to be a researcher. Ida Patch. Okay, and we're currently doing the infinite opportunities agenda. Let's promote and celebrate our technological achievements. Indeed, and we're getting plus four percent happiness. We'll get plus 10% once the agenda is complete in 160 months. 160 months is what, 10 years? Jesus. No, sorry, 22 months before agenda is ready to launch. Yeah, so just two years, less than two years before we can actually launch this. Now, in terms of our edicts, we do actually have a nice edict fund of 140 because we got base of 10, ruler gives us plus 30, and imperial cult gives us plus 10, plus 100, sorry. Um, excellent, we'll actually, what do we have? We have fortified the border, defense of our systems is paramount. This edict will direct additional resources to these ends. And we get starbase upgrade speed, speed plus 50%, and starbase capacity plus two. Don't really need this right now. Then we do have veneration of the saints, of saints. Rather than focusing exclusively on this temporal world, we should provide our spiritual guides with whatever they need to prepare us for the next okay we get harrowspex output plus 20 percent and spiritualist ethics attraction plus 25 percent excellent we'll definitely enable this as soon as we unpause and information quarantine this edict puts strict checks on the flow of information better preserving local cultural identities we get stability plus five and governing ethics attraction plus 50 percent excellent again we'll also enable this as soon as we can uh, but with that, I guess we've sought our government. We've got our society management. Technology-wise, we've set that up. Oh, wait. Hang on. So Ida Patch does actually have an architect. She doesn't have any counselor traits, but she does have, yeah, architectural interest. But she's not the governor. Who is the governor? Yeah, okay. Ren Zane, Minister of State. The junior minister is our governor. Uh, but all he has is a that. Adaptionist. This leader is quick to adopt new methods and ideas that prove superior. Well, he's young, so I think he'll build up experience hopefully quite quickly. So, 
that's fine with us. Not, not bad, not a bad start. Yeah, I guess there isn't really much else here. Let's go ahead, just get into the galaxy map and see. So we have two engineering research, three minerals and two energy credits available to us. Have a look where we actually ended up in the galaxy. Here we are, guys. From these humble beginnings, we will yeah, we'll make everyone recognize the Omnissiah as the true ruler of the galaxy. And oh my god. Oh my god. We got a tundra, an arctic world. Excellent. Okay, well. Obviously, we take ISS Shadow Marshal, our only science ship. Uh, captained by Ida Patch, and we immediately go to survey the system of Sidurka. And with that, we can actually unpause. Let's even go with the slow speed. Have a look at our... Um, I guess I'll take a slight, small break from talking. Let's have a look at our science ship, actually. Uh, beautiful. Stellaris also, it's such a shame that you don't actually get a lot of opportunities, Stellaris, to look at your ships uh, all that often. Ooh. And there we go. The first event pops off. The creeds. Guided by the, by the divine towards the stars, various creeds within our faith now anticipate influence over the new government. Each wields considerable sway over the faithful, advocating for the elevation of their members to influential, influential positions and fulfilling their distinct spiritual needs. Only time will reveal if these diverse pressures will bring us closer to the divine or plunge us into chaos. <sighs> Hopefully they will be helpful. Factions form the commune of toil, the templars of steel, the choir of the mind, the fellowship of the hammer. And I think these correspond to, you know, the commune of toil is sort of representing the workers, Templars of Steel representing the military, Choir of the Mind representing the researchers, and the Fellowship of the Hammer representing the sort of the middle class, the artisans. No one really interestingly representing the actual spiritualists, you know, the, the priests. But there we are. Hopefully they will be helpful. But this is our science ship. And the Archmagus Syra Aster is the new heir to our empire and will take the throne when our current ruler dies. Okay. New heir. Yep. And that's also custom for the game. I've named our, uh, you know, our heir has the title of Archmagus. Let's have a look at leadership. Um, Syra Aster, she's... She's got the eye for talent. I think she's female. Authoritarian official from the Tundra world of Kelzaka, where he previously held the position of noble. Okay, he's actually he. But he's got an eye for talent. Leader, experience, gain, plus 5%. Age 24. Um, You know what? Because he is... Hang on. Let's make some changes already. Now, unfortunately, Renzane. Renzane, what do you have? To offer not really much other than leader experience gets so he's a quick learner but look we need a job for our archmagus and he's actually has the eye for talent counselor trait this leader is considered to be unusually perceptive spotting talent where others see only accent eccentricity or incompetence let's put him out here does he do we want to make him governor as well Sector governor, planet governor, he will get basic resources from jobs plus two percent. Well, let's guess, let's keep, yeah, let's keep our uh, re, what was his name? Sorry again, Ren Zane as the governor, so he actually gets, gets some reps in, gets some experience. Now, what we actually also should do. Let's have a look yeah we're kind of gonna we're gonna need to explore as fast as we can into two directions and our first priority therefore is to build a science ship and we will we'll try to get a new scientist in as well and we need to find choke points and you know get systems with habitable worlds that's a priority and choke points are the second priority so you know straight away i will queue up ida patch our head of research and the captain of the shadow marshal to survey these systems 
so that we can block ourselves off and you know, see you know, where where the potential allies you know or potential enemies are and we can start turtling up but there we are let's go ahead and pause we actually can hire a leader already for our science ship let's go have a look we need another scientist what are our options we got relish ritualistic implants on this one because he's of the spiritualist ethic age 34 politician for this scientist Got anomaly discovery chance. Okay, we'll get Jinx Thorn. Seems like he won't be on the council. He will be. Uh, he will be piloting our second science ship. Thorn. I'll send him to survey that Emayo system. Yeah, he's not on the council. Does, does the realistic, ritualistic implants don't actually... No, they do. They give an anomaly discovery chance while commanding a science ship. Entropy scope. Excellent. Okay. Let's have a look at Sudurka. Wow, this is very lucky, guys. I am so pleased. I mean, we could not have had a better start. I wonder what, uh, what kind of... Uh, what kind of habitability we'll have. I think it should be at least above 50%. I hope. Now, while our science ships are doing the discoveries, now, again, straight away, we'll direct... We'll direct Jinx to just scout over here and just see if this is really is a dead end. That would be great. Um, you know, but we will see, you know, how... If we can grab this core constellation, because with three worlds, honestly, that's all we need. This is excellent, guys. Excellent. Um, wow, yeah, really, I can't, can't believe our luck. Um, excellent. Now, yeah, while we're waiting, I guess, what should we, let's have a look at our home world, I think in more detail. We do have a building slot. And I do think the first thing we should do, really, is build uh, some research labs as soon as we gather 400 minerals. We're currently doing 17 physics research, 17 society research, and 40 engineering research. And research labs will uh, obviously give us two researcher jobs and about 8.2 of uh, research. So 8 on 17 is about, that's basically plus 50% research speed. Now, let's go ahead and have a look at the traditions. This is very important. We got our tradition, and we should be getting quite a few traditions early on because we got really good Unity input. In fact, before I forget, we should have done this, frankly. We're already kind of 10 months into the game, but let's activate veneration of saints and information quarantine. We want to get as many spiritualist, um, spiritualists in our uh, among our species to, again not veer away from our faith but also to get those ritualistic implants in and we want and we want yeah extra output for the higher specs again these things sort of just because i'm talking and recording a video but we really have to be careful not to miss anything like this because you know getting every advantage we possibly can will be paramount because remember you know all of the ais could be advanced ais and they have grand admiral so they already started with like three systems and two worlds um, now, back to, hang on, okay, so we, okay, it costs us a little bit of unity to actually activate uh, those, but otherwise, the you know, maintenance of those is free, so we'll stay with our 45 unity, which is very nice. Boom. Ooh, let's see. So we can select, we'll be able to select one, two, three, four, five, six, seven traditions. One of these will be our ascension, cybernetics. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I do think for us, perhaps discovery will be a good opener. Our curiosity about the universe is what got us this far, and there is still so much left to discover. We'll get chart the unknown agenda. We'll get Unlocks Edict, Map the Stars. 
will have anomaly research speed increased by 20%. And adopting all discovery, that, that's upon adoption. And adopting all discovery traditions grants research plus 10%. Grants access to the research cooperative federation type. Now that we want that. Let's see what we get. We get to boldly go survey speed plus 35% and science ship disengagement chance plus 50%. A new age of exploration is upon us as we once mapped the surface of our home world. We must now brave new terrain space. There is a galaxy full of wonder waiting to be discovered. I do like the survey speed, uh, which I think with the edict map, the stars will boost our survey speed by a lot. And we need to, you know, we need to be the first to discover other species and the first to just, uh, you know, survey as many systems as possible and find out where, where are the resources, where are the planets, where are the choke points. There's also science division, which will give us research alternatives, leader pool size, leader experience gain, researchers upkeep. Yeah, I think this is this is the one for us. Otherwise, what do we have? We can have expansion since we're gonna hopefully colonize those those planets. Uh, you know, AS, ASAP. But what does that really give us? Colony development speed plus twenty five percent. Habitat alloys upkeep minus twenty percent. Superior colonies agenda. New colonies start with an additional one pop. Which with two colonies here will give us two extra pops. Pop growth speed plus 10%. I mean, if we, uh, empire size from systems minus 25%. Yeah, that will help us keep our empire size down. Starbase upkeep minus 20%. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I want. We definitely want cybernetics. That leaves us with six. Prosperities, I think, is a good one. We will get mining station output plus twenty percent. Then we get some building upkeep minus ten percent. Well, well I, I, mostly I want the standard construction templates at first. We will get resources from jobs plus five percent upkeep so this is i think prosperity when statecraft is an excellent one right we can get edict plus fund plus 50 but important we can get council agenda speed plus 25 percent and then all councils gain 150 experience as when whenever we complete an agenda so this is big so i want cybernetics that's one so that leaves with six prosperity one statecraft two discovery three expansion four I feel like we will want supremacy. The future of this galaxy belongs to those who are strong enough to seize it. Either, or we might want unyielding to just defend out. The galaxy is vast and full of dangers. But one of these for sure. So one, one of these is one, two, statecraft, three, prosperity, four, discovery. Harmony is a good one. Pop upkeep. Uh, actually, no. The one I think we really want is uh, so adaptability. No, sorry. Which one was it? Um, yeah, sorry. Harmony because it grants access to the Holy Covenant Federation type. Yeah, that's very thematic, very much for us. We get Edict Fund here, Pop Demotion, Leader Lifespan, neg Leader Maximum Negative Traits, minus one, The Greater Good, Governing Ethics Attraction, Planetary st uh, Utopian Dream, Stability, and Planetary Ascension Cost. Yeah, maybe Harmony, if we want the Federation. I feel like the Federation would probably be the best thing there. I guess... I mean, right now, we do want Discovery because it does give research speed plus 10% in the end. I really like that. We do get Map the Stars Edict straight away, and we'll get to boldly go very quickly. And if we do get survey speed at any point, might as well get it now. Otherwise, I mean, soon this will become very useless. Pretty much, right? As once we do the surveying. Let's, let's open up with Discovery. Let's read the flavor. Our curiosity about the universe is what got us this far. And there's still so much left to discover. Agenda available. They sure like to keep up appearances. The agenda chart now has been unlocked. Okay. 
Now we have chart the unknown available. Now one thing actually we should do is change our advisor to spiritualist. Thinking machines are an affront to nature. The right, but we have council agenda available. In fact, you know what? Actually, let's change our the weak govern, the strong rule. There we go. I think I like that. Council agenda available. We'll see that later. Now, in terms of our edicts, we need to make sure we activate map the stars survey speed. So the edict pushes for further galactic exploration to bring light to the darkness and find what wonders lie what wonders lie beyond. We get survey speed plus 25%, anomaly discovery chance plus 10%, ship hyperlane detection plus one. Indeed, let's go ahead. The Emperor has spoken. Let's get all the survey speed we can as soon as possible. Nice. And yeah, just really map map this constellation out uh, to know, you know, which way we got to send. We also don't have a lot of influence at the start to play around with. And so it's important to know where to bet, you know, where, where it's best spent. The discovery of alien life. So ISS Shadow Marshal has made a startling find on Sudurka 3. The planet is teeming with alien life. The first time in history we have encountered life forms that did not originate on Kelsaka. This amazing discovery has silenced those who believed we were alone in the universe. Although none of the alien creatures found in Sudurka 3 are sapient, it is likely only a matter of time before we encounter beings that are. We may not be alone out there. Society research gained 250. Nice. Ooh, wow. Really? 250. Okay, well that puts that to 66 months. That's excellent. Contact reports. Simple luck forms of life. The Hesukaran Empire is abuzz with news of the alien organisms discovered some time ago. Hesukaran theologians have been partaking in arcane rites since the first sign that since this first sign that divine providence extends outside of Kelzaka, attempting to find new answers. Okay. First contact protocol. Okay, our recent encounter with alien life forms has reignited and made suddenly more urgent the old debate on how we should approach contacting, contacting any potentially intelligent alien civilizations we may meet. While some advocate focusing on establishing friendly relations as quickly as possible by contacting them with a message of peace, others advise caution, pointing out that we cannot know whether alien minds bear ill intent towards us and that it would be unwise to let them know too much about us before it is necessary. A third, more radical group, pushed for preemptive action against them. With the security of all Hesukari at risk, they say, we dare not hesitate to take whatever measures necessary to gain the upper hand against any potential Xeno threat. We shall greet Xeno with open arms? No. I think it is wise to be cautious, really. Yeah. We are spiritualists, we're not warlike, but you know, again, we are suspicious. It is wise to be cautious. Yeah, we don't know who, what we're gonna find in this universe. The policy on first contact protocol is set to cautious, cannot, and that means we cannot attack neutral ent entities. Other nations will find it harder to establish communication with us. Negative first contact events are less likely to happen to us. First contact target difficulty plus two. Yeah, I do think it is wise to be cautious. Now let's go ahead to Kelzaka and actually have a look at planetary features. There is of course the sprawling slums, which as soon as we get 300 gold here in a second, I'm going to do that will give us one pop. Uh, and then as soon as we can, we'll proceed with, well, we'll get started with uh, research. Let's Situation do. log updated. We do have one job available. And we have the Voltaum Star Assembly Precursor. I actually have no idea, guys. I always forget. I only complete precursor chains like a few times during my playthroughs of Stellaris. And I have no idea. I always forget what they actually do. Uh, so I always find these really interesting. We have recovered artifacts from an ancient alien civilization on Sudurka 4. They must have been active in this region of space approximately 12 million years ago, judging by the age of the artifacts. 
From what they have been able to piece together, our scientists theorize that these aliens, who call themselves the Volteum Star Assembly, were worm-like annelids, roughly three to four meters in length, that communicated with each other primarily through vibrations carried along their segmented bodies. Interesting, begins the precursor at the Volteum event chain. We get 10, 10 minor ar artifacts. Interesting. To be honest, guys, I think we've come up on the hour. I'm going to pause here, and I think we'll make a cut here for the first episode. I think that was a good intro, you know, into our empire, into the setup of the galaxy. We got an incredible start, 80%. Wow. Uh, okay, this is going to be great. You know, I am super excited for this playthrough now, uh, especially with these two planets. We actually stand a chance. Um, but let's make a cut here, guys. I'll try to keep these episodes under one hour. Again, if you enjoyed it and if you watched until the end and you want to see, well, you will definitely see more of this. But if uh, you want other people to join in our little community, then give it a like button or hit the like button. Give it a like uh, to spread the first episode. Otherwise, yeah, if you have any comments or suggestions, let me know down in the comments. I read every single comment and respond to pretty much every single one. And yeah, really hope that those who tuned into Broken Shackles earlier in the year will tune into this. And yeah, this is this is going to be great, guys. This is going to be really great. It's a lot of flavor, a lot of immersion. You know, I can't wait. Uh, I guess with the new patch and with the new DLC, you know, I don't have that fear that the game will get patched you know, in a few months and then my playthrough is either, either ruined or, or whatnot. So yeah, let's make a cut here, guys. Really hope to see you in episode two. Bye for now.